Okay. Um, um, so wel welcome, everyone, and um, I'm glad to see you all here. And, um, and you know, today we can think about mathematics and, <laughs> and talk about it and, and really enjoy it and make some progress. And we're going to start with, with um, to talk about Lieber Barto, who's making um, fantastic progress on symmetry logic and the CSP problem. Thank you. So, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, organizers uh, Neil, Anush, and, and Alexandra asked me to give an overview talk focusing on symmetry and algebra. So, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'll try to be a good boy and do exactly that. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, what I'm going to talk about is fixed template finite domain CSP. So for now, I, I'm going to define it on the next slide. But for now, it's just a class of computational problems, <coughs> namely decision problems in here. And uh, here's the message I, I want to deliver. So uh, in this class, uh, we know that a problem is hard if and only if it lacks symmetry in some precise sense. Uh, some more details about it. So this implication has two directions. Um, if it lacks symmetry, then it means it, uh, it can express many things, it can simulate many problems, and then it's hard. And uh, somehow uh, we have only one reason for hardness. Uh, if you give me a problem in the class and a hard problem in the class, I, I give you reduction. A computer can give you reduction. It's no creativity involved. Uh, the other direction, uh, the symmetries can, uh, can help in finding algorithms. So, uh, for example, uh, it helps in that you can combine solutions to get another solution. Okay. Uh, the second point is that uh, if I say symmetry, most people would think of, uh, I don't know, automorphisms or endomorphisms that are useless in here. Okay, we need some different notions of symmetry. <clears throat> so in general, so this, this was about CSP and or, or this even a uh, very tiny subclass of it. Of it. Uh, in general, uh, the same points can be made uh, about way more problems, uh, well, way more problems. And the uh, obvious question is, like, how far? Uh, of course, I want to claim that uh, this is true. <laughs> These notes are true for all computational problems, but of course, this is a bit too optimistic, right? Yeah. <coughs> all right, so let me start with the definition of, of the problem. So this slide will reappear, and I will just the rest in the rest of the talk. I'll try to give some details for, for these points. So, uh, what is the CSP or fixed finite template? Uh, so, template, a uh, template is the right pronunciation, right? Uh, template is a, a relational structure, which is a set and a bunch of relations. Uh, relation for me uh, is either a subset or or a predicate. I will use both viewpoints. And uh, now uh, what an instance is, uh, it's a PP, primitive positive, sentence over this structure. So PP means uh, you can use conjunction, you can use existential quantification, well, you can use equality, uh, and that's it. All right, so uh, a typical instance is here. Uh, these variables x, y, z are constrained to be in the relation R1. That's why these clauses are called constraints. Uh, TZ should be in the relation R2, and uh, YYZ should be in the relation R1. And we want to satisfy all the constraints, uh, meaning we want to uh, find out whether this formula, this existentially quantified formula, is true. Right. So uh, in this way, uh, this is a decision problem. Uh, please interrupt me if this is not clear, because th th this is the topic somehow. So. Uh, one can formulate it in other ways, like a uh, homomorphism problem to fixed, uh, fixed structure, Quer queries to fixed relational database. <clears throat> so uh, this is really a tiny part of the whole CSP area, of course. Uh, there are other variants. Uh, you can allow the domain to be infinite. For example, you can <coughs> fix something else. So here we are fixing the relations we can use. Uh, you can fix, you, co you can, uh, you need not fix the relations. You may say uh, try to fix how the cons how the instance. instance look like, some structures. Uh, you can uh, try to study a similar problem with with different connectives, say allow for all quantifier. 
many, many versions. Um, even in this version, there are uh, way more questions we ask, uh, not only this decision version. We can ask, uh, well, instead of decide, uh, find a solution. In this context, it is the same, actually. Uh, you can count the number of solutions. You can, uh, well, optimize the number of satisfied constraints. So you are not uh, satisfied with the answer, no, uh, you cannot satisfy all the constraints simultaneously, but you want to satisfy as much as possible. And, uh, and you can approximately optimize, so half of optimum at, at least, and you, 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 you of, of course want to do it fast. Uh, all right, so for each relational structure, we have a computational problem, and we want to study the complexity. Uh, well, descriptive or, or computational, uh, here I'm interested in computational and only rough one, so modulus, say, polynomial time reductions. So, uh, this is, of course, in NP. As yes, you see, you guess the evaluation and check it. So a couple of examples of what problems you can express. So choosing the template uh, in various ways, you get various problems. Not so many, but uh, say various forms of SAT problems. Right? Two SAT, three SAT, one SAT. Uh, coloring problems. Negation. There was no negation. No, negation is not allowed. Oh, uh, yeah, this is describing the relational structure. So uh, I, my domain is 0, 1, and I have uh, here three binary relations. The first relation is just saying uh, one of the, yeah, it's all uh, pairs, but uh, 0, 0. Okay, so this is specifying the relations. <coughs> uh, okay, so coloring problem, if, you, if your domain is three element, and uh, you have inequality relation, then this is, this is uh, as you see, three coloring problem. Uh, solving systems of linear equations over finite fields, or any other systems over finite algebras, but this is a good example. So uh, here the domain is uh, the prime field, okay, and uh, say, uh, add there all ternary relations which are affine subspaces, okay? So we, in this way you can, uh, can code linear equations. <coughs> Uh, here are some problems interesting for lower complexities, like connectivity <coughs> between two vertices in a directed graph or undirected graph. Right. Uh, so uh, there is a conjecture that this is not so wide class, mm, that uh, there are no intermediate problems. Okay. Everything is in P or in P complete. Uh, well, and uh, we want to prove it. And also we want to find the boundary, right? How to recognize <coughs> easy problems from hard. So uh, here are some selected results. Uh, of course, I'm not listing even, even some important ones. But so it's uh, my selection. So uh, concerning the, the dichotomy conjecture itself, uh, some, oops, some old results uh, on Boolean domain, uh, it's true. Uh, if you have one single undirected graph, then it's true. And now some more modern results. There is a gap, as you see. So uh, three element domains as well true. For general relational structures, if it contains uh, all unary relations. It seems kind of general already. Uh, this is a generalization of this graph theory result. So uh, you don't need to be undirected, but you need to have uh, <coughs> You say all unary, you mean only unary, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Any structure, but the structure must include unary relations. All unary relations. Plus, so, plus, plus anything. anything. Yeah, so it's. <coughs> well, and then the last line, there is a question mark. So there is an announced solution. Uh, well, it's not written up, uh, it's complicated, but, well, I would say at least 50%, and it's um, morally okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, like uh, this is a uh, this is a problem which which doesn't which certainly is not out of reach, but uh, I guess solved already. Error? Pardon me. Say fifty percent, and what is the margin of error? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't feel confident that this guy is true. Dmitry Zhuk from Moscow. <clears throat> so uh, other results, uh, we know when we can apply some some algorithms. Uh, we can, for example, try to describe all solutions, 
and we know exactly when we can do it. Um, describe doesn't mean a list. Uh, I will get back to it. I, I give you some details. Uh, we can study when we can use some uh, some easy algorithm like locally uh, locally looking like uh, you know this variable must be either two or three then this variable must be you know, do, do such kind of, of local reasoning. So this is done as well. And uh, in all these tractable cases above, uh, this is basically all the algorithm we have. Okay, the, the rest is obtained by a combination, non-trivial one, or highly non-trivial one for, for Dimitri's solution, but, but still combination of these two principles. Uh, there is a, a, some nice work on finer complexity classification, say what uh, CSPs are in L or NL and such things. Uh, I don't have space to list them. <coughs> So these are the results and the problem. So now uh, I want to explain this part. So uh, if you can simulate many problems, then you are hard, uh, which gives you some reason for hardness. So uh, what does the simulation mean? Here is a, a simple example. Uh, let's consider one relational structure with single ternary relation. This is an artificial example, just to illustrate that. Uh, reductions. So, uh, and we have a second template, uh, the same domain, binary relation, turn, uh, unary relation, and uh, these are defined in a primitive positive way from, from the old ones. Okay, so this is a concrete example. Now it's uh, very easy to see that you can reduce CSP over this structure B to CSP over this. How does the reduction go? So uh, here is some example instance, and you just uh, plug in the definition. Yeah? You get some extra extra variable here because you shouldn't use z twice, but that's that's it, right? So uh, there are many names for it. Like I, I see, uh, I hear gadget quite often in here. So gadget reduction, okay. primitive positive uh, definition. So uh, in marginal, so uh, I on example I described this PP definition and. Uh, quite easily if uh, A, PP defines B, then CSPB is easier. Okay, and you can uh, slightly generalize this, this uh, gadget in a way that uh, here each variable is encoded by a single variable, for example. So you can uh, use a more, uh, so if you want to reduce, say, uh, three coloring to three sat, then of course you cannot do that. So you encode one variable by two variables, say. But as, as long as you do it in a primitive positive way, then, then you are fine. So this is non-technical description of this PP interpretation. For a logician, if you know what interpretation is, that's it. Just restrict it to primitive positive formulas. Right? And uh, there is something slightly more general, even uh, PP constructs, uh, which somehow include homomorphic equivalents. Uh, well, it's not so, so this is fine print, so it's not so important for this talk to, for you to understand these. But uh, a corollary we get if, if your structure can simulate something hard, then the CSP is hard as well, of course. For example, 3 sat. Right? Uh, remark says uh, if you cons PP construct something hard, like 3 sat, you actually PP construct every finite structure. So 3 sat is very expressive. Right? So now this conjecture about precise borderline should make sense. Uh, so if you PP construct 3 sat, you are hard, obviously. If you don't, then uh, we hope, and hopefully Dimitri can prove that, that the CSP is in P. Right? Very, very nice uh, distinction. And, uh, yeah. So that's it on the relational side. What? What is so special about 3 sat? There is nothing special. Choose any NP-complete CSP. Uh, this, should, this remark should somehow explain that. If you PP construct 3 sat, you construct everything. So, okay. So you coloring. Have PP restrictions are <coughs> different NP-complete problems, maybe somewhat different. Yeah, in, in the CSP board, this, this tiny board, there, are, there is only one reason for harness. Okay. I mean, perhaps the comment is that uh, three, 3 sat. PP constructs every Boolean <coughs> relation. That goes back to seven. I see. 
So it, it, it's as powerful as it can be in terms of expressibility at the PP level. So any NP complete is like that? Any any NP complete CSP. Any, any complete CSP. CSP. Any, yeah. Okay. CSP. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I ask, um, do you know, are you going to talk about how hard is it going to be to answer that question whether PP is constructed through self? Uh, NP complete. Okay. Am I right? Oh, NP, NP, in NP. No, but isn't it like quasi, -sig it's quasi sigers, right? Yes. It's quasi sigers, and so your result says it's NP hard, does it? Yeah, so it's NP complete. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that's because of cores. Somehow cores are trouble. <laughs> getting core is, is hard. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the the mathematics behind is universal algebra. So let me make a uh, quick digression to explain you what universal algebra is. Okay. Uh, so if you don't like colors on this slide, then that's on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very popular uh, way how things are presented. Uh, of course, it's useful, but for this, in this context, it's it, uh, it's not the right viewpoint, right? So, what is a group? Uh, algebraic structure with binary relation, unary relation, nulla relation, and axioms, right? There is some example, not so interesting, permutation group when this set of elements happens to be set of mappings, right, and, and, and the operation is composition and, and so on. Monoid, the same thing, uh, binary, relation, binary operation, <coughs> the nullary operation, some axioms, I guess one, right, <laughs> associativity. Uh, some particular example is transformation monoid. Now what universal algebra is do, uh, algebra or universal algebra is any algebraic structure, right, some set and some operations. So if you put it this way, then it looks like a crappy field, really. <laughs> like, uh, so if I meet a model theorist, like, why do you so insist on uh, operations, really? You can code them by relations anyway, <laughs> right? So I, I keep hearing this. Uh, if, if I meet some real algebraists, like you know, people doing <laughs> rings or, or groups or modules, well, they are, they are already complicated and interesting. Why, why do you go like, you know, above? That's, that makes no sense at all. Uh, Students, like, <laughs> have you seen four array relation, uh, operation? <laughs> no way, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't appear. Well, so there are all objections because the, the thing is presented this way. Right? <laughs> so uh, what is the right way, in a, uh, or right way in this context? Uh, and I, I think it's historically the, the way, right? Uh, <clears throat> so permutation groups are objects which should capt capture symmetries. Right, so permutation group is, is the basic object. It's just set of unary operations on a set, closed under whatever, right? And now, uh, what is a group? So people realize that uh, many properties of permutation groups only depend on like abstract structure. If you forget what the concrete operations are doing, just remember how they compose, right? Like solvability is an early example, right? So. Uh, for me, permutation group or group is a unary algebra, either concrete or abstract. It's, it's an algebra with unary operations, right? Now, a function clone is an obvious generalization. You allow a higher arity symmetries. So uh, the, the notion is function clone, a subset of uh, some mappings of higher arity, possibly, which is close under composition, right? So how do you compose, maybe? Yes, if n is bigger than one. Yeah, so uh, it's like uh, creating term operations. Uh, okay, so say if you have binary operation in your clone and another binary operation, you can define ternary operation, say, by defining h on x, y, z is f of x, g, x, y, f of y, x, for example, like this. Okay, so any, uh, you can build meaningful ex expressions out of operation to get an operation in this way, and this is what the clone is closed about. That's, that's a direct generalization of, of groups because they are uh, the same as uh, they are closed under term operations, but the terms are s somewhat simpler, right, in unary case. <clears throat> so this is a, a function clone. Sometimes people call it clone. I don't like it because of this. I mean, you don't say. Uh, you don't say group, you say permutation group. You don't say 
monoid, you say transformation monoid. Why would you say clone? You should say adjective clone, <laughs> right? And, uh, and the real clone, I would delete this, you know, is, is the abstract version of it. So you, you forget what the operations are doing and just remember how they compose. Okay. That's the ter term algebra, no? These are, yeah, the, I, I can say it's a set of operations close under term operations. Yes. They're just different viewpoint. I'm not uh, just trying to uh, tell you that group is a unary structure, <laughs> not binary, right? in, in here. So, uh, right. And these abstract clones are studied. That's what universal algebra mostly do. Uh, there are different names to it, like a variety and uh, many other. So. So that's it. So this is end, end of digression. Now back to, to my points. So what is symmetry now, uh, I think is, is obvious. So you have a relational structure, A, and you can look at the automorphism group, or endomorphism monoid, or polymorphism clone. So what are these? These are just symmetries of hierarchy. These are uh, operations which preserve every relation in, in your template, All right? Now, uh, perhaps there is enough time for some example, like so, uh, what is a polymorphism? So let's consider Hornsat, this ternary relation in Hornsat. And the ternary relation is, mm, like in logical way, it's like this, it's a relation on 0, 1. So if I want to give, give you explicitly the tuples, these are all triples, but one, which is 1, 1, 0, right? All triples of, of Boolean values, but this one. So uh, just to illustrate uh, what, it, what is a polymorphism, there was a question. Uh, I claim that uh, the binary, uh, binary, what, max operation, which means, uh, like people denote it by, by this, right? Binary max operation is not a polymorphism. It's not a hierarchy symmetry. Uh, why is that? So we want to uh, this relation to be closed under under this. What does it mean? If uh, if you take two tuples from the relation, which I'll uh, draw like columns, okay? So let's take this one is oh no, this one is in in the relation. I take another tuple, say this one. And you want to apply component-wise your operation, okay? So apply uh, this maximum to the rows. You get one, one, zero. Ah, too bad. It's not. It's not a symmetry. Maximum is not a symmetry. Uh, on the other hand, minimum is a symmetry. So uh, let me try to show you the argument. So the the only bad uh, bad guy here is one, one, zero, right? So uh, let's try to fill it in so that I get a contradiction. Right, so what do I do? Uh, so I have, uh, okay, now I have a uh, minimum. So because I get one here, I must have uh, one one here. Because I get one here, I must have one one here. Because I have zero here, there must be at least one zero. Uh, right, I cannot get, find you a contradiction. So minimum is a, a polymorphism, and this is actually the reason why Hornsat is tractable. <clears throat> uh, all right, so there is a trivial object. So. Uh, like this automorphism group always ob uh, contains identity. Polymorphism uh, clone always contains projections. These are the trivial guys. Uh, there are some different notations. Like some people call it zero, some one, some two, <laughs> uh, for some reason. Uh, example is uh, like 3SAT, it has no symmetries. Not, not only unary, but uh, no symmetries of high hierarchy. Uh, a 3SAT. So I, I gave you the structure which encodes 3SAT. It doesn't have <coughs> symmetries, even these more general symmetries. Right. Uh, now let me try to explain you the first point there. The problem is hard if it lacks symmetry. Okay. So uh, it's all in this uh, theorem, which is uh, which is just categorical nonsense, basically. Right. Uh, so the first thing says that uh, a structure A, PP defines structure B, if and only if uh, you have this inclusion of polymorphism clones. Okay, so uh, PP definitions are exactly captured by polymorphisms. This is by uh, independently by these two guys and many other people independently found that. 
Uh, this uh, second more general notion of, of uh, simulation was PP interpretation. This is captured by clone homomorphisms. And, and at this point, we go abstract because homomorphism is a mapping preserving composition, right? And it doesn't matter on, on the actual operations. So here we see that the complexity only depends on abstract clone. And there is some uh, weaker version of homomorphism, uh, which is still enough to guarantee you reduction. Yeah? Can you quickly remind defines, interprets, constructs? What, what, what? Well, defines uh, means that uh, for each relation in B, you find a primitive positive formula defining that relation. Uh, in interpretation, you can use uh, constructions like powers and uh, substructures and quotients. And in uh, PP constructions, you can use uh, homomorphic equivalents. Can go to, yeah. So this is the somehow foundation stone of universal algebra written in a different way. This is the Berghoff's theorem, more or less. Okay. Uh, now, for, from from this fact and uh, the previous slide. No. Yep. 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 Well, yeah, yeah I, I didn't explain that. It's some weaker form of homomorphism. It doesn't need to preserve all compositions, by, but but just some. Oh, I, I'm not going to explain it. Can we think of the PP constructs as A, PP constructs the core of B? Is that, is that the homomorphic equivalence? Yes. 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 So it's yeah, reducible to the previous case by passing to the core, isn't that right? Uh, no, 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 that's not, not right. You must first do PP interpretation, and then, but then homomorphic equivalence. This is a more general construction than passing to a core. Well, this is a big mistake we made, passing to a core <laughs> right away. <laughs> So this is just like uh, anything. So uh, yeah, three sub PP interprets every structure because we know its clone is trivial, so it has homomorphism everywhere. So that somehow uh, gives you a proof for my claim before. Okay. Now uh, the proof proofs are constructive. Uh, if you give me A and B and a uh, uh, Tell me, give, give me, and, uh, and you promise me there is a PP, say, interpretation, then uh, a program can find you this PP interpretation. Ah, ah. These, uh, these, uh, these formulas would be oh, huge, like double, ex double exponential or something. Like that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Double exponential, I believe. Yeah. And they must be for some reason, right? It's somebody proved, I think, that they must be huge in general. <clears throat> Uh, now, what, what does it mean to have a homomorphism? Uh, uh, another way of saying the same thing is that it preserves equations. So, uh, you know, homomorphism maps mappings to mappings, and it say if <coughs> an operation is associative, it must be mapped to associative operation. It's preserving equations. And uh, this uh, other notion, I didn't explain it, but in terms of equations, it means it preserves equations where there is no nesting of terms. Okay, I'll, I'll show you some examples. What do you mean by generic reduction? Uh, that, that, that it's algorithmic, uh, no creativity required. <laughs> oh, I see. So it comes recursivity on the left, recursivity on the right. Uh, yeah, there is a program giving me the reduction whenever it exists. Okay. Yeah, right? So uh, now the tractability conjecture uh, reformulated. If there is no weaker homomorphism from the polymorphism clone to trivial clone, then CSP is in P. And we know from what I told you already that otherwise it's MP complete, All right? Now uh, there are like many, many, many characterization of this of this fact. Uh, here are some examples. So uh, here, here are some examples. Uh, the second item gives you some uh, one uh, look, random looking equation, which is the weakest equation for, for finite algebra, actually. Right, so uh, a clone satisfies some non-trivial equation. Non-trivial here means, this is like homomorphism wise, so non-trivial means it's not satisfiable by projections. Okay, to translate the definition. So here is a concrete example. Here is another concrete example. It's a like, generalization of commutativity, right? So the conjecture says that if you have like generalized commutative symmetry, then, then you should be tractable. Very nice, right? <clears throat> and also, this gives you concrete things to work with. So if, uh, if you have a symmetry, you can try to use it in your algorithm. And I uh, hope hopefully show you some of this. So uh, here is just uh, two items of the 
<coughs> of the previous slide. Uh, if P is not equal to NP, then we believe, or maybe Dimitri can prove, that CSP is tractable if and only if it has such a symmetry. All right? But what we know from this just this categorical nonsense, more or less, that uh, even though this might be wrong, perhaps, but uh, we know that the complexity is captured by, by uh, simple equations. So not necessarily this one, but this bunch, perhaps even infinite, bunch of equations which look somewhat like this. <coughs> Term, variable, uh, I mean, function, variable, function, variable. Okay? And when you say infinite, is there Nice description. Yeah, yeah, well, nice description is this if, if we believe the conjecture. Uh, but in general, we can just say that it's even like infinite disjunction of, of, of such conditions. Well, it's, um, well, yeah, it's a good question, but, but nobody's looked at it actually. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, to the second point, this is, sim this is easy. Uh, just one simple slide. Why are uh, endomorphisms useless? Well, two reasons. For each structure, there is another structure called the core, so that uh, core with uh, constants at it, but, but there is uh, another structure such that they mutually PP construct each other, and the other structure has trivial endomorphism monoid, right? So, uh, and the second reason is that this homomorphism order, I remember that the only, only thing that matters is whether there exists a homomorphism or not. This, this order itself is trivial in groups because there is always a homomorphism between monoids, a trivial one, right? So this is a different math. This is not any kind of generalization of model theory, right? It's, it's perpendicular to model theory. It's, it just studies more asymmetries. <clears throat> All right, uh, now I want to show you somewhat how uh, the symmetry can be exploited in algorithm, the positive, positive side. So, uh, so how universal algebra helps in it? So we have some tools, surprisingly. Uh, the other important point that it helps in, uh, in identifying intermediate cases. You want to prove some conjecture, you know where to look at, right? I'll show you on examples, or at least one. Uh, how, d uh, how polymorphisms are used. So directly, I already said that uh, it's a way to combine solutions or partial solutions to get a, uh, another solutions. Uh, indirect, it helps in proving correctness. Okay, you want to prove that some algorithm works. The algorithm doesn't talk about polymorphism, but still you use them intensively to prove correctness. Uh, there are these two algorithmic ideas uh, I already discussed. So describing all solutions, this is the direct application of, of uh, polymorphisms and uh, checking local consistency, trying to solve it by consistency. So let me go to the first one. Uh, it's old. <coughs> so uh, let's say we have an instance of CSP, say n variables. Now the set of solutions uh, can be thought of as an array relation, right? We just list all, all possible solutions. Uh, and uh, it's easy. Uh, to see that this is invariant under the symmetries of, of the template, right? So it's an invariant relation under polymorphisms. Now, of course, it can happen that every n tuple is a solution if, say, you are given empty instance, right? So uh, you cannot list all solutions, but uh, you can still describe the set of solutions, and a natural description is via a generating set, right? So uh, a classic example is say solving systems of linear equation over ZP, over a prime field. Uh, what are the polymorphisms here? If you compute, these are, these are exactly affine combinations. <coughs> so uh, mappings of the form f of x1 through x4 is f of x1 through xn is sum of ai xi, where these guys sum up to 1. Uh, affine combinations. Now, yep. Sorry, what is that? Peeling. Uh, this is the problem of solving uh, systems of linear equations over ZP, over the <coughs> prime field, Galois field of P elements. Uh -huh. So, uh, so now, uh, the solution set is an affine subspace. It's just invariant under affine combinations. 
Now uh, it has a generating si si set of polynomial size, right? Namely, we know it's n plus one. Say, a square is generated by zero 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 one one zero, right? So we have small generating sets, and we can hope to describe all solutions by means of generating sets. Now, uh, so this is uh, solving system of linear equation. Now, uh, universal algebra tells us some obvious class of algebras we should look at. Right? And the uh, obvious next class is Maltsev algebras. Uh, it also suggests some different class uh, of algebras or clones or how, how do I call it, uh, which also have this property. You know, invariant sets have uh, small generating sets. What do you mean by Maltsev algebras? Yeah. Uh, so let me see. Well, uh, let me try to briefly tell you about this. So Maltsev, uh, I mean, I'm not defining these, but let me tell you what Maltsev is. <coughs> <laughs> what Maltsev operation is. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's an operation which satisfies this, these identities. Simple linear height one identities, all right. And uh, uh, in that example of linear equation, so a, a fine operation satisfying this is, is this one, all right. So this, uh, but in general, uh, if you have such a symmetry, Maltsev polymorphism, then you are tractable. It's not that easy. Uh, uh, the first proof was actually really hard. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is a good question for descriptive theorists. It's not known whether this is definable on, in LF, LFP plus rank, I don't think. Toy, coys, toy case, nice toy case. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so why, if you have such an operation, you have like small generating set. So the basic idea is, say, if in your relations, you have tuples <laughs> AB and, uh, okay, I draw them like this before, right? If you have AB, uh, a, C, A, B, A, C, A, C, what, what, D, C. So these three tri uh, triples, if I draw a picture, it looks like Z, right? Then you apply your Maltsev operation and you get the, the remaining edge in the Z. So meaning if you want to represent, say, A square, it's enough to uh, include such a generating set, for example. So the basic idea why uh, you have small generating sets. Uh, all right, so different classes, uh, algebras with linear unity operation. Uh, you, hear, uh, you know what majority operation on two element set is, so this is a generalization of that concept. Now, uh, universal algebra also suggests some class covering these two, right? So it, it gives you a road how to, how to uh, somehow try to do something general. And uh, here is the general theorem that it can be pushed as far as it gets. So uh, one condition is, that all invariant and relations have small generating sets. That's what you want if you want to hope for this kind of approach. Uh, the second one is uh, a different alternative uh, characterization that the number of NR invariant relations is only exponential, because uh, in general it's double exponential. And in this case, there is an algorithm which, which solves uh, the CSP, even it finds the generating set. So it's like some people call it the generalization of Gaussian elimination. Uh, it's maybe not a proper name, right? Because it does really something different in the algorithm. All right, so this is the first uh, algorithmic idea. The second one uh, is this local consistency. So it is uh, some rough definition of that concept. Uh, if uh, CSP can be solved by looking locally at the instance, we call it bounded with. So here is a possible more technical definition. You have two numbers, K and L and uh, you do this KL algorithm. Derive everything you can derive on K tuples of variables by looking only at L variables at a the time. There is question what this considering means. There are different concepts, but you know, for, for this general level, it's, it's all equivalent. It doesn't matter really. So now you, you derive the strong constants, uh, constraints. Now you may find a contradiction. Right? In that case, you know that uh, the, cons uh, the instance has no solution. In uh, other case, you, you know nothing. But for some templates, uh, if you cannot find contradiction locally, then you cannot find it. You cannot find it. It is solvable. Right? So in such a case, we call it bounded width. And there are like many, many, many equivalent uh, characterizations of this. So uh, for, for the CSPs, 
fixed template CSP, it is the same as definability in least point, fixed point logic. Right? Uh, now, there are some old results. Uh, for example, the first one, if you have a semi-lattice polymorphism, such as the maximum opera uh, minimum operation for Honsat, then uh, uh, only very simple consistency called R consistency is enough, right? The width was defined as a pair of numbers. Oh, yeah, so it should be width 1, 1 here. One. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, if you have some kind of majority, then uh, it has width n, n plus 1, say. Some bounded width. Uh, Non-example, linear equations. You cannot solve it locally. The Gaussian elimination is a global algorithm and it's necessarily global. Now, uh, obvious conjecture, well, obvious now, but, but you know, the road to, to it was not so simple. If you can simulate uh, linear equations, you are not bounded with. Okay, so otherwise you should be bounded with. Right, and again, you know, the algebra suggests what to do next. There are some intermediate cases which makes no sense to you, right? But, but we knew like what, what other uh, concrete case should make sense. Right? And uh, after, this, uh, after this progress, uh, there is a full solution, and it is indeed true. <coughs> uh, you cannot simulate linear equations, if and only if you can solve it locally. Uh, there are some improvements, like uh, it's never, you should never look at more than a pair of variables. Right? It's a funny thing. It's collapse of the hierarchy. Uh, even simple consistency, called singleton R consistency, is enough, and uh, I believe, I'm not quite sure, this plays the problem into uh, n-square time. Okay, so from polynomial uh, to n-square. Also some funny coincidence with uh, the, uh, solvability, exact solvability by convex programming. Right, it's the same as the, the canon, it's a semi-definite program, solves it. Right, so this was the second principle. Now, uh, yeah, I have like 10 minutes, right? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, uh, I should talk more slowly, maybe, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, why not? So uh, I told you this, this simple result. Let me just draw one picture to illustrate how polymorphisms are used again. So you have an instance. You have some variables. Uh, for each variable, you have some possible values, x uh, and uh, you do some consistency so that possible values are not nonsense. Okay, so there are some possible things this variable can attain. And now uh, the claim is if you are consistent enough, whatever exactly it means, <laughs> then you have a solution. And I tell you, uh, all right, let's simplify it even more. The domain is uh, linearly ordered, right? So like this, and the order is this. And we have a minimum operation as a polymorphism. All right, so what is the solution? You just take the minimum in each, uh, we call it potato. Why? Because if you are consistent enough, uh, so let's assume there is a binary constraint constraining these x and y. Okay, so some set of possible edges in here. So uh, because it's consistent, there is zero and something. Because if there is no such pair, I would remove this during the consistency. And similarly, there is one something. Now just apply the minimum polymorphism, and you get that there must be this edge as well, and that's, that's it. That's very simple, right? And uh, for the majority, it's also very simple, and that's the, these are actually all cases for the Schaeffer's dichotomy theorem you need. Um, all right, so uh, beyond, some particular examples that we know, uh, well, these points are valid. In, uh, I don't mean that, I don't want to make the point that in general uh, automorphisms are useless, right, by far, but it's not the only useful thing that's meant in here. Uh, optimization, exact optimization. You want to find uh, not, not only solution, you want to optimize the number of satisfied constraints if the, con if the instance is not satisfiable. This is done. Uh, so one thing is, these guys uh, invented a concept which is a generalization of polymorphism, weighted polymorphism, and what it is is actually a probability distribution on, on uh, operations instead of one single uh, array operation. Now, uh, 
this works even in a way more general concept when you don't necessarily have relations, but you have uh, weighted relations. So each tuple is weighted by some rational, say, or infinity. Now, uh, Kolmogorov, Krokhin, and Rolinek proved recently that if our conjecture is true, then we get a it exact dichotomy for optimization. Right? So they use the somehow CSP as a black box plus linear programming, and this solves everything. Fantastic, I mean, it's a whole bunch of optimization problems. Well, I'm lying now. Uh, well, it's fantastic anyway. <clears throat> counting number of solution. Uh, again, uh, this is exact counting. Uh, success story, uh, we know, or we knew, that uh, it only depends on polymorphisms. And uh, now we have a precise borderline, borderline what, it's, what is easy, what is Hard and our <coughs> generalization in, into valued and complex valued and, and so on. Robust satisfiability. Uh, that means you are not satisfied to find a solution for a satisfiable instance. You also uh, want to find almost solution to almost satisfiable instance. So if, if you transmit it and it's corrupted by some small noise. Right? So when can you do this more robust uh, <coughs> solutions? Uh, again, complexity we knew is captured by polymorphisms. We also knew that uh, this guy here, system, a solving system of linear equations, is very bad concerning approximation. This is the uh, result of Hastat Gödel price result, actually. And uh, yeah, and the other direction is also true. Like whenever you cannot simulate linear equations you can somehow robustly satisfy it. Uh, the algorithm is um, yeah, some semi-definite programming and, and some complicated rounding. Uh, infinite domains. This whole slide devoted it because I like it very much. Uh, if you allow infinite domain, you get all computational problems up to polynomial time reductions. Right? Uh, well, so that's maybe not what we want to attack right now. Right? Uh, so you, you restrict to something more finite, like uh, uh, Aleph not categorical or oligomorphic. Now there, there, which is still quite quite wide class, uh, still the complexity is captured by the function clone of polymorphisms. Uh, we don't know that whether abstract clone is enough, uh, but abstract clone plus topology. So there is some other nice math. Uh, in it, but still it almost covers all decision problems, I mean all complexity classes, almost all, meaning uh, they can find a reduction which is not polynomial, but I don't know, some with NP oracle, something like that. But still, there are, there are undecidable problems in, in this, and it's still captured by, by symmetries very easily. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, when you restrict even more, then uh, you are somehow very finite. <laughs> you are back to NP, and there is a concrete dichotomic conjecture where, where the borderline is, and there is some progress. Wait, restrict even more means? Uh, restrict even more. That would be finitely bounded reducts of homogeneous structures. So a homogeneous structure is fine. Take a reduct, and it must be finitely bounded, which means uh, you can describe it by finitely many obstructions. <coughs> and then this places it to, to NP. What would be an example of an infinite structure? Uh, yeah, uh, problems in temporal reasoning, like Q is less than, and all reducts, or first, first order reducts. So it includes such classic problems like betweenness, is, is in this, or, okay, so problems like all temporal reasoning is, is actually done. This is not written here, this result. For some special cases, it's done. <coughs> All right, so uh, now how far, I mean, b beyond these things where we already have some success. So as I said, like everywhere, <laughs> that's the, the goal, right? Uh, but some immediate things we want to, uh, we want to consider. So uh, approximation, uh, it's interesting. We know there are some, well, almost known, there are some approximate polymorphisms which are important. <coughs> But we don't have any such nice theory. So if, if unique game conjecture is true, then uh, we have a dichotomy, NP complete or, or polynomial, by a result of Rakavendra. 
And the polynomial cases are captured by something called approximate polymorphisms. But uh, we actually don't know, uh, without, don't know without this uh, UGC. And uh, this is a nice playground for us because the hardness part in these problems is hard. Right? It's, for example, uh, this PCP theorem is, is hardness of, of, uh, of such <coughs> problems. So, so this is, a, for us, like in this fixed template CSP decision problem, hardness is very easy, as you see. Right? There's one, uh, one hard problem and the reduction is for free and it's, it's really trivial. Here is a good playground for, for someone trying to understand hardness better. So uh, there are some, some good cases of hybrid CSPs where you place restrictions on relations, but also on the shape how the instance look like. Uh, example is perfect matching problem in graphs. It's, it's such a nice CSP and it would be really nice to have appropriate notion of symmetry. So we, uh, and other examples, approximate counting, hybrid count, <laughs> many other variation, variations. Uh, but but it, what, what is the point? We, we, we know, we know about the perfect matching. What is to be gained here? Uh, yeah, so you want to, to again study all edge CSPs, uh, CSPs where each variable occurs only twice. Okay. Right? So if you, if you choose one, uh, one template, then you get perfect matching problem. Okay, so you have a connection with matroids via feathers work. Right? Yeah, 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 we have a matroids, yes. But we don't have the we, symmetry. We don't have a dichotomy for that. We, we don't have dichotomy and we don't know what the <coughs> symmetry ah, is. That's okay. uh, right. somehow exploring what, what really would be a better notion of symmetry, more general one. Right? Uh, in infinite domain, uh, there is obvious challenge to exploit some larger classes would be great to include linear programming into the whole theory. Just explain linear programming in a generic way. And uh, what I'm, this very simple question nobody may be considered. I, I told you that even for Omega categorical structures, uh, this includes uh, undecidable problems. And we know it only depends on the clone. So find the algebraic uh, criterion for undecidability. <laughs> right? Isn't that funny? There is one. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, my <laughs> suggestion. If you, say some, if you see some gadget reduction, you should try to look at symmetries. All right? Thank you. Well, so there's time for more questions, Anush. Um, you mentioned the, the dichotomy for robustness. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to approximation? I mean, they seem to be, I mean, because the Hostad thing gives you a hardness of approximation. Yeah, yeah. so Hostad proved that uh, syst solving system of linear equations is hard, even of in almost satisfiable instance, instances. He, he showed more even that it's hard to find uh, more than a, one and a half. That's right. But we only need this part that uh, oh, if it's almost satisfiable, it's still hard to find almost satisfiable instance. But but, but for that restricted robustness, then you have a dichotomy. Yes. Right. But yes. for the general approximation, we don't. Well, that, that, that's what you mentioned, the UGC. Uh, mod module of the UGC, yes. The UGC. Uh, yeah. and, but the, yeah, it's not understood algebraically. I mean, uh, Rakavendra observed that actually the, his criterion can be phrased in terms of polymorphism, but the only connection we have at the moment. So. Other questions? You? One generalization we do not, did not seem to consider the dichotomy or no dichotomy. Maybe there is a trichotomy. Mm -hmm. P, recursive, mm -hmm. undecidable, for example. Uh, there are cases like uh, quantified CSP, so you allow uh, for all quantifier, and there is, it's possible that there, there is trichotomy, like P and P or P space. Mm -hmm. So there are, yeah. Or such phenomena. And no. time, right? If we, if we look below P time, we have. Well, yeah, mo this, is, this was rough. Uh, this was modulo P time reductions, of course. These questions are also interesting. Okay, I just wanted to say from uh, my point of view that you, you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.